This is Rick Green with today's Constitutional Minute. And this will be our third video looking at the constitutionality of quarantines. In our first video, we addressed the question of who, who has the authority, feds or states. We learned that most of the power lies with the states, and that's why you see your governors and mayors deciding how far this is going to go. And they're the ones that are having the most impact on you, regardless of what President Trump and Congress does. Uh, we learned in the second video that uh, we want to address how far government can go. Can they close down churches, restaurants, public gatherings? We learned that state laws give most almost unlimited power on paper to state government. And, and, and once that public health disaster has been declared, uh, then, then they tend to have free reign. That does not mean that such actions pass constitutional muster. Uh, we're already winning lawsuits to stop some of these crazy COVID crackdowns. And I mentioned yesterday, it's got to be a compelling interest and it has to be narrowly tailored and least restrictive. So we'll get a little further into that today. So now it's actually a good time, today's video, to kind of talk through these circumstances of of can they shut down public events and places and when can they do that? Like how bad does it have to be? What's, what's the criteria? If, if you will, how high does the bar have to be for, for how dire the situation is with a disease before they can implement these kind of, of crackdowns? What, what does their certainty have to be with regard to the science and the data? So in other words, you know, upon what criteria can quarantines and other measures be taken? And the answer is, <laughs> there isn't much of an answer. I mean, look, some states require that the disease be on the CDC's list of quarantinable, communicable diseases. Now, that list is actually created by executive order of the president. It hasn't changed since 2014. And uh, most simply, you know, uh, communicable disease, it's a definition that says an illness that occurs through the transmission of an infectious agent. Okay, it goes a little further than that. But either way, there's no specific number of deaths. There, there's no uh, specific description of how um, contagious it has to be or how many people are infected or any of that. It's literally a judgment call by our chosen representatives as to what their criteria should be for when they interact. Now that, it may be very hard to define and maybe that's why the statutes are so um, open. The problem is there's no real check or balance. There's virtually no check or balance on governors right now and the decisions that they're making. Uh, that means, you know, how long can these executive orders force businesses to close? Well, it's up to the governor, unfortunately. Now, that's that doesn't seem right, does it? I mean, does that seem American to you that one person can tell an entire state where they can go, what they can do, when they can go back to work, of course that's un-American. And, and of course there's constitutional problems with this. So in the, in the first time uh, in this conversation about quarantines, I'm going to shift from what could be done. In other words, what do the statutes and the laws and the Constitution say to what should be done? Not do you have the power, but should you use the power? Up until now, we, we, we've just laid out what's available, kind of the rules by which the game is to be played, what actions might be considered lawful if they do pass that constitutional test of compelling. But now I think it's important that since it's so open-ended, since there's so much discretion for our public servants, meaning the, the, the parameters of what they can do are pretty much wide open in terms of what's on, on paper, then it's only prudent for us to begin to cover and, and talk about not just what could the government do, but what should they do. So, for instance, uh, look, the, 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 the parameters of their power uh, being that broad, let, let's just look at a hypothetical scenario and, and ask a basic question. Even if a disease is absolutely proven that it, it's bad, it is so bad, it will most likely kill 500,000 people. But if government intervenes and forces everyone to stay home, we could drop that 500,000 number down to 5,000 then should the government intervene? Should the government, in their intervention, stop all economic activity in the nation for six months until the threat of that disease is mostly or totally gone? Now, that would be with uh, those elected officials making that decision based on the fact that they know. If they do that, if they shut everything down, then they're going to produce immense poverty. Uh, there's going to be a shortage of basic food and medical supplies. There's going to be more disease and death and suicides and depression. And all of those things will happen in order to try and save those 500,000 people. But should we do it? Well, friends, if, if you're shaking your head yes right now, if you're saying yes, we should absolutely shut everything down, it's worth it to save those 500,000 lives. And you should know that's not a made-up scenario I just painted for you. It's not even the current coronavirus situation. It's literally influenza. It kills 500,000 people every year worldwide, kills about 50,000 people in the U.S. every year. Plus, it causes another 500,000 hospitalizations in just the U.S. every year. 
So make no mistake, government could, based on these statutes, do what they're doing right now every single year for the entire flu season. So if you were shaking your head, yes, they should save those 500,000 lives no matter the cost. If that's what you think they should do, then they should be doing that every single year. Now, clearly, we don't do that. We've never done that. We did not even do that whenever the Spanish flu was 25 times more deadly than what we're dealing with right now with the coronavirus. Even in 1918, when the Spanish flu killed 675,000 Americans, when we were only 100 million people in this nation, when it killed 50 million people worldwide, even then, we did not shut down entire economies because we knew what the price would be. We tailored our government actions towards the most vulnerable. We tailored our government actions to where it could do the most good. We didn't do these blanket orders. And even back then, man, the, it was kids dying. It, it, was, it was bad, but we still kept our heads about us and had common sense. So clearly, we don't use that power every time there's a risk of hundreds of thousands of people dying. We as a nation, our, our governors, our, our health commissioners, our presidents, and our Congress, every single year, they make that calculated decision that there are just certain risks in life, certain risks in health, and that we cannot shut down and stop living. We can't shut down the nation based on even those high numbers and those criteria. Hey, honestly, come on, that's no different than the decision we make when we drive. We don't ban cars because 40,000 people a year die in accidents. Uh, we don't choose not to drive personally because there's a chance we could die in that accident. Like it or not, there's a cost-benefit analysis to these things. Government does a cost-benefit analysis, and we as individuals do that cost-benefit analysis. And, and for whatever reason, when that analysis was done back, back in March, um, when it came to this coronavirus, health commissioners and governors and, and, and even the CDC to a certain extent, they determined that the cost on this particular disease would in fact be so high that they needed to move from could to should and actually use this, this power that was on paper uh, to bring our nation to a grinding halt. I think they talked about this stuff. You know, I guarantee you they, they considered the massive economic cost that, that it would destroy lives and, and families. Um, I don't think it was some conspiracy. I think they knew it would cause all kinds of problems. And they weighed, you know, that against what they thought. And I emphasize thought because no one really knew back in March. They thought the massive cost to the American people, they weighed that against what they thought the loss of life would be. And for the first time in all of our lifetimes, the scales tipped and they pressed the trigger on this remarkably immense amount of government intervention. These were, these were big decisions and actions. And I am not saying that they made the wrong call to do something. I am absolutely saying, though, that their decisions to shut down the economy completely, I mean, to, to do something that had never been done in our history, that is going to go down in history as the worst, most foolish, most costly political policy failure in history. The data is pouring in on testing and deaths and the effects on the entire population. And, and we all thought that as that data poured in, these decision makers would react, you know, that they would pay attention to the science, that they would pivot when it turned out not to be even one-tenth of how bad was predicted. And yet they haven't pivoted. Uh, they have not. They, they, they've, they've continued to dig in, to double down, and to further destroy our nation. Those decision makers that chose to use an economic shutdown to flatten the curve should have followed up their swift action with equally swift action, pivoting to something that is more sustainable and just would make more sense. It's just not possible, folks, for huge segments of the American population to stay at home, to not work for an undefined, unknown amount of time. You know, for one week, yeah, that's doable. 15 days, that's, that's doable. Even though we knew, uh, even, even at a week or 15 days, it would have tremendous ripple effects of pain and misery. But it was doable. It was recoverable. A national shutdown for months and months on end, even, a, even after we know, with absolute certainty, based on all of the science coming in from every other nation on the planet, we know that our hospitals are not being overrun like Italy was. Just look at our country. Not a single person went without a hospital bed. Not a single person went without a, a ventilator. And yet we continue to do this. In fact, hospitals were so empty, doctors and nurses were getting laid off. 
This is just madness. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not saying that that initial idea to flatten the curve so we could have hospital beds and, and respirators and testing and all those things. I'm not saying that was the wrong call to try to flatten the curve. I'm saying that trying to flatten the curve by shutting everything down was foolish. I, I've always agreed that those who can stay home, stay home. We made the decision as a family to stay home because we could do it. We didn't, nobody was going to force us to do it. We chose to do it to protect those in our family with autoimmune issues and the elderly that, that live, we live together kind of on a family compound, if you will. And so we've got great grandma on the property. I mean, look, we, we made those decisions to protect those that we love. And we think everybody should have the right to make those decisions. And, and, and that's what freedom is all about. But we have never agreed with this idea of forcing healthy people to stay home. That's for North Korea, friends. That's for China. That is not the United States of America. And I, I, I'm just saying, you know, in fact, let me put it in the, in the words of somebody a lot smarter than me. Mark Levin put it this way. He said, we should not destroy our institutions while trying to save them. And that's the way we need to be thinking going forward. I, I'm going to close out today's Constitutional Minute, but i got to give you some bright spots. You know, we need some good news as well in the midst of all this. So I'm going to give you three quick bright spots. Number one, all these drastic decisions, why are they being made? To save lives. The value of human life is being shown through all of this, especially for those who are more vulnerable. Then the, you know, the, the ones that are making the decisions to sacrifice, they're doing this to save lives of people that are more vulnerable than them. I think that's good. I'm encouraged by that. And for a while, I was, I was afraid that our, our culture of death and violence would, would lead to a devaluing of even our elderly and a willingness to discard those who paved the way for us. But that's not what's happening. What we see happening right now is a great level of respect for not just our own parents and grandparents, but the entire world's elderly population. So I, I think that's a good thing. I do hope that this valuing of life that's on display right now for our nation, I hope that it leads to a higher value of life in the most vulnerable among us, not just those that are less vulnerable than us, but the most vulnerable, the unborn. Just think about that. More healthy babies will be purposely killed in abortions during this crisis. More healthy babies will be killed than all the coronavirus deaths combined. Just think about that. You know, maybe when we're on the other side of this virus, we can get our lawmakers to keep caring about life, to keep caring so much about the value of life and, and start saving and protecting the least of these. Okay, so that's bright spot number one. A healthy respect for life is currently on display. Bright spot number two, there is a huge spike in interest for the Constitution, for the rule of law, for jurisdictions, for federalism. That's a good thing, friends. People are asking the right questions right now. They're thinking about the Constitution when they've never thought about the Constitution in their entire life. Wouldn't it be great if you had the right answers? Here in the middle of this massive, unprecedented government action, it absolutely requires us to know our rights, not just about quarantines, but about freedom of religion, about our Second Amendment right of self-defense, about executive orders, proper jurisdictions, uh, powers of the federal government, and on and on. You can learn all of that in an entertaining way in the class I teach right there in Independence Hall. In fact, not only can you learn it, you can share it with your friends and family. You can become one of our Constitution coaches. We're giving it away for free. So right here on this website, go to where you can volunteer. Uh, we're, we're, we've created this free program so you can access all of our constitutional materials. You can do our biblical citizenship classes. You can be the catalyst for restoring constitutional and biblical principles. So check it out here on this page. Get signed up and start hosting a class today. <laughs> All right, tomorrow at the latest, but get started. All right, last bright spot, and I'll close. I love the fact <laughs> that all of these folks that have suddenly been thrust into schooling from home suddenly have found a great level of respect for homeschool moms. It's going through the roof right now. And can I just say to all the parents that, that you've kind of been thrown into this and you're trying to manage the household, educate the kids, and not go crazy in the meantime, just pause for a moment. Think about the fact that hundreds of thousands of super moms out there across this nation, they've made the selfless decision years ago to sacrifice whatever it takes to do exactly what you're doing right now, and they do it every single day for about 15 years of each child's life. And the best ones, like my amazing wife, they do it with joy and passion. It's just incredible. 
So if your kids have been sent home and your state is saying no school even into the fall, it's just crazy. But if they are, then get on Google, type in homeschool association with the name of your state, and you're going to find all kinds of great suggestions on how to do this and how to deal with this. Uh, these are from people that have been homeschooling for decades. They're the best of the best. Uh, they want to help you. They want to share their experiences with you. Take advantage of that. Um, and, and by the way, look, the best way to get educated is to get on over to wallbuilders.com. Get some truth about our history and teach that to your children. Watch Chasing American Legends. It's a fun way to learn history. It'll bring history to life. It'll make your kids be hooked on history. Uh, check out Chasing American Legends. You can do that at patriotacademy.com or even go to VidAngel and watch it on VidAngel. You'll have fun learning about America's heroes and legends. And, and it's even free there on VidAngel. These are tough times. We're making Constitution Coach free. We're making Chasing American Legends free through VidAngel. Take advantage of all this. Make the most of it. Learn and share. Be a part of the solution. Be a part of the solution by getting equipped, by getting educated, so that you understand, and then you can also teach these principles that are going to save our constitutional republic. I'm Rick Green, and this has been today's Constitutional Minute.